if God's given you if, if God has given you the interpretation to that message feel free and share that with us today Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you couldn't hear this morning, God was saying to us today through a message in tongues and interpretation that the, the heart of it is what you need is not in and of yourself, it's in his presence. And all that we need is in his presence. Can we just take a minute and thank him for that promise? Thank him for that assurance. God, I, I love you. Church, right now, all over, would you just close your eyes and just thank him for his presence? God, what we need is in your presence. What we need is in your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, I love, for me, I, I, I just, I need those moments where the Holy Spirit just gives us the, the confirmation and the affirmation that he's at work. And even that phrase that God was sharing with us through a gift of tongues and interpretation that, you know, there's, there's two sides to that, that, that we need his presence, but also the truth of what the Spirit of God was saying to us today is what we need is in his presence. In other words, there was something that God wants to give to us in his presence that's more, if I can say it this way, more than his presence. Like his presence is for a reason. Boy, it's just so in line with what God is going to share with us through his word today. And so thank you for just being led of the spirit. Which I know there's another song on the list, but that's okay. We're gonna push that to the end of our time because I believe that God wants us to respond to his word and the moments of prayer. One more time, can we just thank him for his presence in this place, God? Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So if, if you can, with me, just we're going to transition, but boy, don't lose that posture of, of worship to God because God wants to do something. And I believe so many times, I, I don't know if you've grown up in church any amount of time, sometimes you hear this phrase that, oh man, the spirit of God just moved. We didn't even get to the preaching part. Well, I believe that God can do that, but I also believe that God can do that through the preaching part too. So let's, let's hear from God today what he has to, to share with us. I'm going to ask you if you would just be seated as we transition our time of worship together today. And church, can I tell you this, worship team, uh, you guys are awesome. I just appreciate your faithfulness and and I know there's so many different, I, I hate when I start naming names, but uh, I know Edgar and Melissa, Melissa, you're just doing double duty, even like TV transportation crew that she's on here today. You can't even see her. It's just behind the TV. So thank you, um, Edgar and Melissa, especially for leading today and all the team as you're walking up, Megan and your leadership there. And I'm, I, was, I, so, I told you I shouldn't uh, start naming names because then I forget somebody. Um, but in the absence of Pastor Clayton this week, they're just they're filling in so great. And it's so, it, here's, here's what I love about what you're seeing on the stage is it's an indicator of something that God's doing here at Calvary Church. This is not a, uh, a spectator sport that we're involved in, that God does have, um, and he's provided for us here in our family, just some incredibly um, gifted and talented uh, credentialed ministers, yes, but it's more than that, that we are all called to be ministers, and you're seeing that representation presented on this stage here today. And you see it if you walk over in the kids' men area, you see just an incredible amount of ministers involved in welcoming kids into the to ministry there. Right now there's classes. Be, it's just cool to be a part of a family that understands when we fulfill
fulfill our purpose, uh, boy, God's glory and his grace is reflected into people all over their community. So that's awesome. Thank you for being such a great family. This past week, we've had opportunities to, to see how that our um, faithfulness, when we worship the Lord, not only in these experiences here, but in our giving, it has impact all over the world. And so thank you. Last week, we focused on what uh, was taking place over in Ukraine and the Poland and the area there and the border towns and all the refugee crisis. And you just responded to what God was doing. And we sent a check this past week um, to uh, that effort and that deal right at $5,000 that uh, God says, that's incredible. So thank you. So the reason why I highlight those types of things is because when we come into a time of worship, it's important for us to understand that when we worship the Lord, we're, we're giving to the Lord. Yes. And it's a, it's an attitude of worship. And truthfully, there's beauty in the fact when you just lay your gift at the altar, whether through worship and offering or whatever, you just say, God, whatever you want to do, with it, that's great. But I know as, as our flesh is sometimes involved in that too, that it's good to hear the good reports of those offerings being um, used in different places. And so even yesterday, if you would have driven by the church, you would have seen the mobile food pantry going on. And, and, and if you would have gone down to the Smith Holmes area here in Greensboro, there was uh, our teams out reaching out there. In a few weeks, you're going to see that played out at Easter and some different opportunities there with our family. So thank you um, for your continued worship of the Lord, but through your giving. And if you're here in the room, there's several ways that you can continue to worship the Lord. You can do that physically. There's an offering an envelope in front of you on that seat back there. You can put a check or cash in there and uh, give those in the buckets on the way out. If you want to give online, you can do that as well. Calvarytriad.com slash give. There's a, a process there that's super simple. You can go there and give, or you can text to give as well. Text the amount to the number 8432. One And so those are ways that you can give. I said this in the early service, but just know for some of you that say, why do they mention all those other opportunities or different ways of giving? Well, the truth of it is, is that we're about split in physical gifts and, and online giving. So uh, man, world's changing, right? So we want to make it easy and uh, for us to, to worship the Lord in our giving. Honestly, for me, transparently, a few years ago, I used to just always sit down at the first of the month or whenever I got paid and like there was something like almost spiritual about physically writing out that tangible check. And it was for me, that was what, it just meant something to me. And I've even, I've gone over to the dark side or whatever. I don't know what that means. But anyway, I've just, uh, I've shifted. It's, it's so much easier to give online and text to give and all that stuff. So methodology doesn't matter. The heart and the content of it does. So there you go. Thank you, Calvary, for being such an incredible family in that. The last couple of weeks, we've taken an opportunity before I jump into the message to, to we've been been saying Calvary uh, family matters or whatever. And so today I want to do the same. I mentioned about the disaster relief efforts that you did yes, uh, this past week. Thank you so much for that. Easter's coming up in a few weeks. It'll be here. And I got news for you. We've got guests coming. And so in as much as we would do the same thing at our own houses, we would you know, trim the shrubs and we'd mow the yard and we'd, we'd clean up the trash and we'd do all this stuff around our house. We're gonna do the same thing around here and we're gonna make sure that we're ready for guests coming. And so in as much, we've been kind of talking to you about what that weekend looks like. And I just wanna say it once again, the, uh, the Saturday and Sunday of the Easter weekend, we've got an incredible opportunity for us to be Calvary family to the community. Saturday before Easter at 11 o'clock, 11 to one, we're going to have a family egg extravaganza. Pun intended, I know, it's hokey, but go with me on that, right? Extravaganza. So what that means is that's not just for the kids. We're going to have food trucks. We're going to have different opportunities for you, um, men and women, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, to come and just have kind of like a family picnic together on Saturday there. We've got different things uh, coming out. There's some, there's some uh, talk about, I don't know what it's going to be, cornhole and horseshoes and whatever else, tossing washers. Do you guys toss washers here in North Carolina? I don't even know. Do you say washers or you say washers? I don't know. So this Texas guy's trying to figure out the culture a little bit. So we're going to have a fun time on Saturday before Easter. Come out there. We're doing, like I said, some food trucks. Trucks. In fact, this past week, we were talking about the planning of that, and there was a lot of bacon mentioned in the, the planning of food trucks. So you cannot go wrong, right, with that. 
I don't know what that means, but it was, it was good. It's going to be a fun time, Saturday, 11, and then obviously on Sunday, at Easter Sunday, the, the worship experiences. Can I tell you, just, uh, can I give you some, um, just some, maybe some family issues? Can you do me a favor on that Easter Sunday, especially? If you're here, if you're like a faithful tender, you're here all the time, you get here early, know that that, that day we're going to have some parking issues, which is a good problem to have, right? We already have some challenges with some different spots not being available, which is good, but you also understand that we need to, to talk through some of those logistics. So even on that day, if you want to park in the back or park on the grass somewhere or whatever, we'll, we'll forgive you just to make room for our guests a little bit that day. So that's going to be a fun day on Easter. And then as, as well, I mentioned um, my cheat sheet here. I mentioned some of the reasons why our worship team, Pastor Clayton was gone and, and uh, this wasn't on my list, but I think it would be appropriate for us to say, and Pastor Clayton's probably watching this online. He was in Dallas this week for the release of a new album that he has, has written and produced and released. He released it this week, it's Saturday, at one of our Bible colleges. So if you go on to Apple Music or Spotify, wherever you get your music, um, Awaken the Dawn. It's an incredible um, album by our worship pastor, Pastor Clayton. God's given him some amazing songs of worship and just uh, reflecting the heart of our worship to God. You heard Pastor Clayton say the heart behind it is that we would give God the first fruits of even our day, that we would awaken the dawn. The, our days would begin with praise to Jesus. I just think it's a great opportunity for you to make yourselves available to that music as well. And then also, as it relates to our family here at Calvary, we just have an opportunity this week to... Um, to just be Jesus to a family that has gone through a tough time. And we're gonna just allow our partnership with the Harmon family to come together Saturday at two o'clock for a celebration of the life of their son, Mark. And we're gonna join together with this family. I know you would want to uh, know about that. That'll be Saturday, this coming Saturday, April 2nd, two o'clock here at the church. And we're just gonna let this family know that we love them and we care for them. And um, God is good, amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I meant what I said about um, giving some time to the, uh, at the end of the service today. We're going to um, have some time of response because I believe that God is preparing us for what, not just a short-term move of God, but a long-term impact into the triad and to see what God is doing all over this community. And so as we prepare and as we ramp up, so to speak, to the Easter season, which is a time when everybody is just focused on on things of God, which is great. We should use those opportunities, right? Um, But as we prepare for that, I think um, God's just led us to a, a moment in exploring some of the lives or some of the events in the life of Jesus. Last week, we started kind of a mini series talking about these extraordinary everyday events that Jesus had in his life. And we talked about this idea that not all of us have like a highlight real life, right? Like every day is not just like the super exciting, everything's just incredibly dramatic. It can't all be March Madness for us, all this, right? It can't all be, now I understand, I appreciate back, you know, my wife and I are from Texas and I knew that if there was a good, you know, in in church, if there was a huge Cowboys game, especially if it was an early game, the attendance in church would be really sparse because people were like getting prepped for, I know there's a basketball game later tonight, of a school. In fact, someone said, John, you, you, you wore the right colors and all this stuff for the Tar Heels playing tonight. So yeah, yeah. No, that's not what it was about. But anyway, however, I know that we can't all be all this, this, this drama all the time. It's not always excitement for some of you that, that are aware that, you know, say, what are you talking about March Madness? There's this little basketball tournament happening right now that, uh, I don't know. It's kind of could be interesting. And for those of you that are aware, I'm kind of pulling for a Duke UNC matchup in the final four. That would be pretty fun. And uh, you guys would all hate me to know that I picked Duke to win the whole thing. So there we go. Oh, Jesus. You just left the room. No. Anyway. Well, this idea of this highlight reel uh, moments, it's not always all exciting, but we have these normal everyday events in our life. And uh, boy, Jesus did too. Last week we talked about him when he was a teenager. He got lost at church and his parents left him. And you go back and watch that. It was an incredible story to see how that these normal things. Well, today I want to talk to you about this idea. Again, this series is just this idea of these extraordinary everyday events. Today, specifically, 
I know this may be foreign to all of you, but for the, just go with me, and I, this is for me. I have had these moments in my, my life in the past where I'm just tired and hungry. Have you ever been tired and hungry? Have you ever been that right now? How many of you are tired and hungry right now? Can you just be honest? I see hands, more hands went up for that question than the response, no, I'm just teasing. But the, sometimes we get to this moment when we're tired and hungry, you say, how in the world is this anything spiritual? Well, stay with me a little bit, but before we get to the deeply spiritual, there was just something that I thought was pretty funny this, uh, this evening when I was preparing for it, and I thought about trying to figure out a way I could tie it into somebody here at the church, but it just, there's no tie-in needed, but I'm not sure what you look like when you're tired and hungry, if you look something like this kid here or not. I'm, I'm, I don't even know who this little, little guy is, but I'm just, I'm loving his tenacity and going after for some of you that are having trouble. Can you see it? Can you? <laughs> I don't know what you look like when you're tired and hungry, but for this little guy, that PBJ was incredibly important and he's fighting through being tired and hungry and yet still on purpose. And you say, Pastor John, you have lost it. Well, stay with me because the truth of it is Jesus didn't necessarily have a PBJ, but he did go through an instance where he was tired and hungry. Let's look in Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four, verses one and two, it starts off and it says this. Then Jesus, you gotta catch a couple of these phrases because they're incredibly important to the end of where we're going. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot in that, right? Full of the Holy Spirit. He returned from the Jordan River where he was just baptized. He was led by the Spirit. Do you understand? He's, this is the setup to the story that we're about to see. He was full of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all of that time and became very hungry. He was tired and hungry. And in the middle of him being full of the Spirit, being fully God, remember we talked about it last week, he was fully God and fully man. He was fully God, he was full of the Spirit, and yet he was hungry. And so there's this, this supernatural thing happening and a natural thing happening. And I believe that the writer in, in this gospel, Luke, tells us the specifics of this situation to give us hope, to give us an understanding that in the middle of my natural, normal, everyday life, when I get hungry or tired, you say, you know, whatever, that I can still be filled with the Spirit and, and understand that the supernatural is at work, even though the natural sometimes just feels a bit natural. Well, Jesus does, keeps on going. It says this, in that context, in verse three, it says, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus said, uh, told him, no, the scriptures say people don't live by bread alone. That the devil took him up and, and revealed to him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because, listen to this, this is interesting, we'll unpack this in a minute, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Luke 4, 8 says, Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, this is the devil saying to Jesus, the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. And when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. I don't know about you, but when I read that story, I get a lot of um, uh, comfort to know that Jesus went through some similar things that I have gone through and continually go through in my life. I just got, you know, if you, you've kind of, if this is a shocker to you, just understand, the devil is seeking 
you out to destroy you. Like there is a plan. God's got a plan for my life. He does. I believe that. But the devil also has a plan for your life and that's to destroy you. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. He's got a plan and he was even trying to enact his plan against the son of God. He was understanding that even though Jesus was full of the spirit, he was tired and hungry as well. And he came in the middle of that time to tempt him. See, I can relate to that because just so many times in our life, it's this roller coaster of emotions. Have you ever had that experience when you had a, a Sunday morning uh, moment or maybe a church service? Some of you guys used to, maybe you went to youth camp or a big event that you had this moment where it's like God was doing such an incredibly cool thing. And like the day after your car breaks down or the water heater goes out to your house or you, you know, the tree falls on you, whatever. And it's just like this up and down. And before long, you're like, I've got this joy that God's doing something awesome. And then all of a sudden, oh, the normalcy of life. I become tired and hungry. And in the middle of that tired and hungry, the devil creeps in and says, Psh, that stuff, that was just fake. That wasn't God. You saying God loves you? Why would he let you go through that? That wasn't God. Let's bring it really home to some of the things that we've walked through even past in our in recent past. In our, you know, we, we have this high of, of God doing some incredible things and then a loved one passes away. God cared for you and he, he loved you. He wouldn't let that take place. And all of a sudden the devil begins to jump in and an opportunity comes in where he tempts. It's this up and down emotion. And I, I just know that when we look at these seasons of Jesus' life, it would be wise for us not just to see the highlight moments of him raising Lazarus from the dead or him you know, walking on water or calming the sea, but there's also those moments of just extraordinary everyday events that God wants us to learn from. So today I want us to look at some different things on this idea of temptation. And when Jesus, remember, full of the Holy Spirit, he didn't do anything wrong, and yet walked through this season of temptation that was incredibly powerful for us to look at. There's some thoughts that I want us to just glean from it. First thing is this. Temptation can be a diversion to meet a God-given need in an ungodly way. Well, Jesus had that experience in the first part. It says that he ate nothing at all, that all that ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. How I mean, you understand that hunger, physical hunger, it's a God-given need. God gives us opportunity to, to fill our physical body. We all get hungry. There was nothing wrong with him becoming hungry. There was nothing wrong with it at all. And yet in the middle of that, the devil says, to tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. People don't live, you know, and then Jesus replied, people don't live by bread alone. What was taking place here? There was a natural God-given need, hunger, that the devil was trying to tempt him to do something in an ungodly way. I, I was thinking about this this week. And can you imagine, take the context of what the devil was tempting him with into a different setting. And if there were a story, for instance, maybe the feeding of the 5,000 or feeding of the 4,000, you know, when Jesus multiplied all this food and fed, he was supernaturally doing a work for a natural need, right? So that was, that was God could use that. And yet, if in that context, the details of that story were different, it wasn't a little boy bringing the, the, the fish and loaves to the disciples. What if he brought a rock? And Jesus turned the stone into a bread. Would that have been a miracle of God? Absolutely, because the miracle was that God was providing for them in a way that was bringing glory to him. So what I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes there are these natural needs that the devil gets up on your shoulder or gets in your head and says, hey, if you'll just do this, then, then I'll meet this. It's a, it's a natural need met in an unnatural way. Let me bring it home because one of the most uh, applicable ways that we see how that the devil does this all the time time is as it relates to physical needs like in our sexuality. So, oh, Pastor John, how, you're getting off on a rabbit trail. No, I, this is a temptation sometimes that, that says, well, you can meet this God-given need in an unnatural or ungodly way. The devil distorts and he diverts our, our addressing of natural physical needs to an unnatural way. Maybe it's in the hunger. Maybe it's in addictions that we say, hey, we, we need these a the, uh, uh, painkiller or different medicines that God gives doctors wisdom to create. And those are, those are great and fine. I don't 
don't uh, belabor that at all. I believe God can heal, but I think sometimes God gives us wisdom to use the knowledge that we have to create these things. But then the, the abuse of those things in an ungodly or unhealthy way could be a temptation to fall into sin and fall into addiction and those traps of behaviors that are not, not godly. You see, so many times these things that the, that the devil diverts our attention away from saying, God, you're my provider. I want to be pleasing and honoring to you. He can tempt us to meet these things in an ungodly way. What about financial? It's coming up to tax season, right? Ooh, I can just, I can get all this. It can be easier. I can make all these provisions take place if I just tweak the numbers a little bit, my tax return and whatever. And you say, oh, it's just, you know, God wants me to, to be blessed so that I could give more. No, no, no. The devil can tempt through different things to meet a natural need in an unnatural way. He did it with Jesus. Temptation can try to get us to meet a right need in the wrong way and in the wrong time. Even in the story of Jesus, it wasn't time yet for Jesus to eat. It wasn't time. There was still a process. He was rushing that process. Second thing that temptation sometimes does that the devil uses is he simply does this. There's a, he distorts or he, he twists the truth. There's a distortion of the truth. If you don't believe me, look in the scripture we just read, Luke chapter four, says the devil took him up and revealed all the world, the kingdoms of the world. And then he says something that I just, I, I mentioned, I kind of inferred it earlier when we read through this. Do you understand the, the ridiculousness of the statement that the devil is using here to communicate to the son of God, who is fully God, he's the creator of all things, right? And yet the devil distorts his truth in that moment where Jesus is tired and hungry. Sometimes our defenses get down and that distortion of the truth can look so much more um, maybe truthful in that. And the devil used this same methodology here. He said, because all of these kingdoms, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. Now, for those of us sitting here right now, we look at this story uh, from, from time removed, we understand how, wow, that is, that's simply not true. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. He created everything. God owns all the kingdoms. It's not the devil's to give. And yet in the middle of this temptation, the devil used what's called the distortion of the truth to say to even the son of God, hey, this is true. And, he, and I, I, it's just like the devil, boy, it's like, you know, come on, you know, that's just... I kind of have this like giant thought bubble over this thing that says, duh, you know, that's not the deep theological response to that. But I'm like, how can you be so great? This is not even true. And yet in the middle of our lives and in my life, I know that when I'm being tempted, sometimes there's a distortion of the truth that if I'm not careful and if I'm not responding in the way Jesus did, that I can fall into succumbing to the pressure of that distortion of the truth. Jesus replied the right way. So the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Well, I don't know what your temptations are or what the truth that sometimes Satan uses in your life to distort, but let me give you a few examples of what I see in, in our lives and in my life in the past and just in honestly, not even in the past, ongoing. It's all, we're always in this fight, right? We're always in this and we've gotta be aware of that as, as followers of Jesus and not be too high and mighty to say, oh, I've arrived. I don't struggle with those temptations. I got new, boy, if that's you, boy, I really need to hang out with you more often because apparently you've got this whole thing mastered and you're like, you know, but I, when I read my Bible, Bible, I just understand that we are all growing in these areas and far be it from me or far be it from us to ever think, oh, we're beyond this. Because when we start doing that, boy, Jesus himself was tempted. So some truths that sometimes we look at and say, oh, this sin, this temptation, it'll bring you lasting fulfillment. It probably doesn't sound like that, but it sometimes sounds like, hey, this'll, this'll last forever. It'll just keep going. This is real happiness. It'll just be fulfilling. Well, Moses had the incredible example of this and the writer of Hebrews says it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the, here, listen to this, the fleeting pleasures of sin. They don't last. They don't last. Some of you may have heard this before. No one will ever know. 
You know, you've heard it in your mind. Ah, just do this. It'll be in secret. No one will ever know. It's a temptation. It's a truth that is not a truth. It's a distortion of the truth, right? The devil tries to get us to understand that or to, to grasp and believe that. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, it says, but if you fail to keep your word, then you will have sinned against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Well, for me, that comes into play a lot as it relates to parenting. Don't you love the wisdom that comes from parenting that you can say? How many of you, your parents ever said to you, you remember your mom says that she's got eyes in the back of her head? You ever hear that? You know, whatever. Yeah. You moms and dads have probably used that too. And all of the students that are in the room, kids like, I don't understand how that moms and dads know this. Well, just trust me, we have our ways. And we can't tell you, it's like the magician never tells us tricks. You never tell that. So we have our ways. But the truth of it is, even as moms and dads, we understand that even though our children think, oh, we're gonna do this certain thing and we're gonna get away with it. How many of you understand that God has a unique way of letting moms and dads understand that and know that and feel that and that intuition is there? And we just know it's awesome. (laughs) It's so fun to understand and know. And uh, here's just a little secret to know. Sometimes we don't know initially, but we know all eventually we find out and then we pretend that we've always known, right? So that's just a little secret. We just do it that way. But the devil also comes into the the play in this and he tells us, even as adults, as grown men and women in whatever level of maturity, no one will ever know. Yeah, they will. Be careful, church, when we fall into temptation. Remember, we're full of the spirit and yet still there was temptation that took place in the life of Christ. Don't, don't equate or don't confuse temptation with a lack of godliness. <laughs> temptation is just that, it's temptation. The Bible says that we should resist the devil and what we should do, what should our approach be to temptation? To flee. In other words, it's not really something you should mess around with. You should flee. Oh, I'm strong enough. I can handle that temptation. No, you can't. The Bible wouldn't tell you to flee if he thought, you know, if the word said that you could handle it. No, flee, run away from, remove yourself. Probably another truth that I could have put up there that says, hey, you can handle it. You can manage. You can walk through it. Boy, that's a lie from the devil himself. No, the Bible says flee from temptation. If you're in the middle of temptation right now and you feel it and you just know you're tempted, I'm just going to tell you to be so bold as to remove yourself from that situation, remove yourself from that relationship, remove yourself from the opportunity that God sometimes wants to pull you out of in that. Temptation and the sin it leads to, it'll always take you further than you wanna go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. Always. Church, you understand the, the, the beginning of this story. I keep going back to that because I don't want you to get, get discouraged. It's like, oh man, this is just so tough. The beginning of this story, Jesus, full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit to walk through this process. Third thing that the devil tried in this situation is to be a distraction from purpose. A distraction from purpose. Luke uh, chapter four in the ninth verse, it goes to say, he took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you're the son of God, just jump off. Now, (laughs) I'm not sure that this is exactly the deep theological uh, principle involved here, but can you just understand, can you go back to your um, time as maybe a teenager or whatever? And for me, it was probably more than that, like middle school, when I had my huffy bike, bike, you know, whatever, the bicycle or whatever, and it was the baddest thing ever. And I could pedal, that thing was so crazy. It was awesome. And back before we had video games, we actually played outside, guys. It was kind of fun. You should try it. So anyway, a bunch of... 
A bunch of crazy moms and dads in here. They're looking for some. Yeah, that's that eyes in the back of your head. I'm not even going to look at you right now. But I had this Huffy bike or whatever. Was, I don't know if it was Huffy or, Huffy or whatever. It's probably Diamondback. That was my cool. I don't know. But I remember this, these moments where we would be out riding bikes and my buddies and I, we would be just thinking we were cool. And there's a lot you could do. You guys understand this. I'm about to say something that's going to, you know, you'll know, you'll know. There's a lot you can do with a couple cinder blocks and a two by 12, right? You know where I'm at. You put that cinder block out there and, and put it down. If you put, if you're really, you know, awesome, you can put two or three or whatever. And then you put that long enough two by 12, or maybe it's a sheet of plywood, I don't know. And you get down at the end of the street and you take off on your bike and you try to hit, you got to make sure that you hit that. That's why I said two by 12. So you get whatever. And you try to jump that ramp. And if you are really awesome, then you get that one gullible kid. You know where I'm going. You know that one gullible kid to come on this end of the ramp and to lay down and just, you know, right over there and see if you could jump that kid. Don't tell me you've never done that because that was just the most fun, awesome experience. And I can just see a moment like this. And back in the day, this was the, the time where you would say, you know, the things like, you know, I dare you. And you're like, oh, whatever, I, I could do that, but I just don't want to. And then somebody would like up the game a little bit and they would say, I double dog dare you, you know, or whatever. And you're like, oh no, yeah. you know, and then you have all these different kid things. In fact, Kim and I were talking earlier, you know, you guys remember the story, the Christmas story when little, was it Ralphie or Mike? Ralphie, you know, Ralphie was tempted to stick his tongue onto the frozen pole for what purpose? None. But the double dog dare you? Are you kidding me right now? How can I pass that up? I'm going to stick my tongue on that. No, I'm going to jump my friend here and I'm going to do it. Don't you? Oh yeah, whatever. And before long, we don't even know why we're doing this thing, but this is going to be the, like, you know, I know we put people on the moon, but this feat that we're about to take place right here, it's going to be awesome. And I'm going to jump that kid. And yeah, the back tire may actually crush a rib or two, but that's okay. It's going to be awesome because we're going to go over this and there's going to be this moment where it's cool. He said, Pastor John, you've lost it. Well, maybe a little bit, but the truth is when I hear the story in the scripture about this, I kind of put myself back in that moment of that time. And it's almost like the devil's like getting really desperate because there's absolutely no purpose to this temptation, right? I get it. Stone into bread. I'm hungry. You know, worship. Oh, glory, all this stuff. This one is just like, I dare you prove that you can do it. And if we're not careful, we can allow the devil to get us distracted so much from purpose. You say, John, apply that. Well, for me, this distraction, I don't go back. No one's going to tempt me to get my bike and jump a person. No, no, no. But for me right now, you know where it plays into, to, to, goes into play here in my life? Technology. Because even to this day, I have to be careful that I'm not distracted from my purpose early in the morning. When I get up and I have my times with Jesus in the morning, I sit on the couch and I've got my Bible, I've got my little journal there and I've got my cup of coffee because the Holy Spirit can't move without coffee. <laughs> Claudia's in the back just getting blessed by that statement right there. And if I'm not careful, if I put my phone right there or my iPad or, or whatever, and that little zzz goes off, there's no purpose. There's not an emergency. Like everybody that's important in my life is like within 10 feet. There, you know, it's not, but that little zzz, you know, whatever. If I'm not careful, there's a distraction from purpose. The best purpose that I can have in that moment right there is to spend time with Jesus and to prepare for the rest of the day. But that distraction comes in and I'm kind of pulled off sides, so to speak. It's almost like the devil was doing the same thing to Jesus. He, he's tried everything else. He says, hey, just jump off. Just prove it. I double dog dare you. You say, ah, oh, there's a little bit of comedy in that or whatever. Yeah, there could be. But the truth of it is, is that sometimes temptation looks really bold. And other times it's kind of a subtle thing that creeps in. And if we're not careful it just becomes a distraction. Can I tell you this? This is in my notes. But even in ministry, even in doing the things that are pleasing to God, sometimes good things can be a distraction from the purpose that God has called us to. 
In the middle of that distraction, what it takes us to a point is to say that, that when we go through those, those, those times of crisis or temptation, our spiritual disciplines growing in that relationship with Jesus are unbelievably important. Because the truth of it is this, that, that sometimes the way, I, I, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Let me go back. Ah, oh, that's a good quote. And you already, I pulled the curtain back a little bit. The crisis, there's a statement early, uh, later on that says this. It says that crisis, it doesn't um, uh, unveil or, or create disciplines, but it reveals our disciplines. In other words, the things that are already there when we're tempted, they come out. So be careful that our disciplines are... Uh, are such that we've, we've uh, allowed them to become rooted in our lives that we are there. This, this quote that I was getting to is this idea of distraction. Even this past week, I was reading through, author Bob Goff has this statement. It says, the way to beat distraction is to become captivated by something much bigger and much better. I love that. I love that. He goes on to say, so just purpose and joy. But for me, I see, you know what? When I get distracted, even today in these last few days that I've been kind of wrestling through some noise stuff or whatever, things that don't really matter, I just have kind of tried to do these mental gymnastics of saying every time that distraction comes in, focus on something bigger, something better. And that is the purpose of God in yours and my life, that this distraction can be a temptation of the enemy. Finally, as we close uh, today, Jesus modeled this for us. All of these temptation um, elements are at play here, and yet Jesus modeled that he defeated this temptation by two things, by the Spirit and the Word. By the Spirit and the Word. You remember the first verse of this passage talked about this. He was full of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. And Jesus, through this, ma- this model of, of interacting with and dealing with temptation, he modeled to us that we overcome temptation by the Spirit and the Word. It's the statement I meant to say earlier, crisis doesn't create disciplines, it reveals disciplines. Jesus modeled this. And remember, I talked about these bookends of the Spirit. I, this is so key. If, you've, if you're, if you're kind of zoning, get back with me right here because this is the truth that'll bring you to a place of application into your life. The bookend of this story says, then Jesus, the front part said, then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. He was not at a place in his life that he was living in sin. He was Jesus. He didn't have that ability, right? He just was, he was fully God. But I believe the writer was saying this to us to say that that we also can be full of the Spirit and yet be tempted and tired and hungry. And normally, when we're tired and hungry, that temptation is more effective. Temptation comes and we apply the Word. Spirit, we apply the Word. And then the end of the story is equally important. At the end of that temptation time, the very next verse, it says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Now, boy, you gotta catch this. The ability for you to fulfill the purpose of God in your life, is there's a pattern for it right here. Do you understand the progression of what has just happened in just an everyday event in the life of Jesus? Luke chapter three, it talks about Jesus being baptized. Why was he baptized? Well, it was an example for us. For us, when we come to that point of repentance and beginning our life with Christ, the Bible says that we should follow that pattern and be baptized. It's the outward expression. It's us saying to the world, I'm going public. I made this commitment to my faith in Jesus. I wanna be baptized and show the world. That's cool. That's great. That's awesome. It's biblical. Right after that, that. He's full of the spirit. He's into the wilderness. He's tempted on the back end of that. He's led by the spirit filled with the what? Holy Spirit's power. And then if you look in the rest of the book of Luke, what happens? Jesus's ministry and the purposes of his life are filled and they are given to us in unique detail to say all of this was a process to be kind of a launch pad for him to be set out and said, okay, then he returned to Galilee. Why is 
that important? Because it was in that area, in that region, where he was going to do miracles of raising people from the dead, of seeing people healed, of, of blind eyes opening, of creating this, this example for us to say, hey, be filled with the Spirit, know the Word, and I will fulfill the purpose of God in your life. It's all part of an extraordinary everyday event. Church, there's, there's an opportunity for us that's so huge to say, God, you have called us individually to be an incredible husband and, and, and wife and mom and dad and grandma. Yes, and, and then yet corporately as well, you've called us to be a part of a family that wouldn't just be about, oh man, that was an awesome time today. That was an incredible you know, hour and a half in God's presence. That was cool. Now let's go play golf. All right, well, now let's go watch some TV. No, 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 you're missing it. This is a moment where, where God allows us to come together to say, hey, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, this is the time for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit's power, not just for, for goosebumps and feelings. Although I've said it before, I'll say it millions of times. I love that God gives us those feelings, right? He's created a, I, I love the experience, but it's more than the experience. Why is the message in tongues and interpretation even this morning so significant? The Bible says that that, that gift of the Spirit is a sign for the unbeliever. And you may be in this room today and you say, I haven't even begun my relationship with Christ. I don't know what you're talking about. But that earlier, like something I felt like that was right, that's the Spirit of God saying to you, hey, it's real. This power is not just a feeling. It's actually for a purpose. It's for people to be drawn to the heart of Jesus. And for us as an, as an incredibly privileged and, and just blessed group of people that every week, every, you know, even twice, three times a week, however many times, you can come into a moment like this in the presence of God and experience and be filled with the Spirit's power. It's for a reason. It's so that people in Walmart and Target and then at the car wash and, and all the different experiences and expressions of life, it's so that they can look at you and say, there's something different about you. And when temptation comes and the, the, the double dog dare you kind of moment comes up, you say, you know what? That's just a distraction from purpose. The scriptures say, this. I'm the salt and light, and you've called me. I am the son and child of God. There's nothing you can, devil get behind me, and I will not be distracted from the purpose that God has called me. So the worship team's going to come and help me close, and there's a reason why that we are, are focusing on this idea of power, because Jesus himself gave us these examples for this um, this new work of what he was saying to do. In Luke's gospel, the end of this story, it says this. Luke is writing and he's quoting Jesus and Jesus says, there's forgiveness of sins for all who repent. And remember, we talked last week, Luke was a physician, so this witness idea was really important. Like there was some specificity in the stories Luke was sharing that were valid, that were true. And he says this over and over in his gospel. It's really cool if you unpack it to say, this isn't just something I'm making up. You saw it, like you are a witness of this. So there's this detail in this. And he, it's almost like he's recounting what he has heard him, had Jesus himself say, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. There's a beginning of the relationship with Jesus that's important, and that's what he's referring to here. But then he says that Jesus quotes, he says, and now. In other words, there's a progression. There's a different thing. He says, okay, there's forgiveness of, of sins for all who repent, and now I'll send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father had promised, but stay here in the city. He's talking to his disciples. Can you see the moment when they, they're understanding the significance of the risen Savior saying to them, you're about to go on a journey that's really difficult, that's really going to cause you some tension and some trials. He wasn't selling them, a, a, doing a bait and switch, saying, boy, it's just going to be roses and awesome. No, some of them knew. They were facing persecution. They would be facing martyrdom. They would be facing just incredible trials. But he said to them, he said, but, but wait, but wait until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you 
and fills you with power from heaven. Can I tell you, the word from his spirit today through the interpretation of tongues was spot on. It says, you know what? What you need is in the power. Yes, we need, the, I hope you understand that. What we need is the power and the presence of, of God. Yes, it's there. But in the presence, he gives the power. It's not just the presence. But you can't have the power without the presence. And I know you're like, oh, it's chicken and egg. No, it's really not. The presence of God gives you power of the Spirit. It did for Jesus. And in the middle of that, the temptations that it came up against him, he was able to fight against them. So what are we going to do with that word? What are we going to do with the the principle of the word and the spirit enacting this, this sense of action in us? Well, that's the question that you have to answer. As, as the pastor of the church, I can tell you this, we're gonna lead a movement of people that impact this community and the world. In fact, next week, we're gonna talk about how this plays out. There's a progression in this idea of, of being filled with the Spirit. Well, if we're filled with the Spirit, then Acts tells us this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. People will be changed because of what you have inside of you. That's the result of being filled with the Spirit. That's the whole purpose, is the Father heart of, heart of God saying, I just want my kids to come back into relationship with me, and I need you to be filled with, my, filled with my Spirit so that they will see me through you. That's what the Spirit does. Would you stand with me all over this room? We're going to begin to prepare our hearts to respond to this Word. In a minute, we're going to come around these altars, and we're just going to, once again, focus our hearts, worship team. I know I cut you short, Edgar, wherever you want to go on the, the lead for that song. If you want to go back to that one we missed, that's fine. But, but in a moment, we're just going to respond. And church, I'm going to just encourage you with this thought before we get to that point. You guys understand that we're talking about the normalcy of life, and Jesus had these experiences too, and it was all for a purpose. And it was for something incredibly extraordinary. I believe that God allowed him to go through some, through some things there, even in this temptation time when he was tired and hungry, that he, he had this reservoir of divinity within him. And when he was hanging on that cross, he, he made a withdrawal from that, 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 that divine nature and said, God, this is really difficult, but it's finished. For us, we have a moment to say, God, I will not be diverted from a natural need by fulfilling it in an unnatural way. I will not believe in distortion of the truth. I will not be distracted from my purpose. And I will firmly believe that I will defeat the temptation of the enemy through the spirit and the word. And for some of you today, you just need to ask God for more of his spirit in your life. And we're going to allow that to be a response time. All through the book of Acts and through the different times of the New Testament church, we see that when people have this initial experience with salvation and then they are filled with the Spirit, so many times there's this pattern that we believe that is true because it's Bible, that when people are filled with the Spirit, they do begin to speak in other tongues. And you say, oh, that's weird. No, it's Bible. And what God does is he allows that to be an indicator of this in here, what he has done. But I can just be bold and tell you that that is not the end-all, be-all purpose of the filling of the Spirit of God. The end all be all purpose is that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will what? You will be my witnesses. Why is this important? Because God is trying to get us to understand that he wants this season in our life and in our world to be a time of harvest where the lost come home, where people are healed, where people are set free, where they are released from this bondages. And God wants to use you to do it. God wants to use you to do it. So in a moment, we're gonna come forward and we're gonna respond and we're just gonna open our hearts and we're gonna say, God, fill me, fill this room, fill this room. Before we get to that point, I'd be remiss to say to you that are joining online, maybe you're in the room as well and you haven't yet to begun that, begin that relationship with Jesus. Today's the day, today's the day. You can do that. And it's just as simple as saying, Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. The Bible says that every one of us has sinned. You're not alone. 
I'm sorry for my sin. I know there's gotta be a penalty, there's gotta be a payment for that sin. And you just say, Jesus, I'm so thankful that you paid the price on the cross for the sin that's in my life. You've already paid that penalty. I received that forgiveness. And I just wanna begin my life with you today. If you're online, there's a way to respond online. Then click that button. We'd love to pray with you in that moment as well. Church, can I tell you this, even a little coaching here? One of the reasons why we focus on that little connect card in front of you is because in these moments, there will be people that you just feel like the Holy Spirit is drawing you to and saying, hey, you need to go pray with them. You need to, you need to be that hand outstretched to them. Go pray with them. And then have a little connect card in the back of your pocket and have them fill that out. You say, oh, that sounds real whatever and hokey and all this stuff. No, it's just a way for us to connect and to, to follow up with and to not leave a baby Christian out by themselves. But it's that connection thing for us to really, we mean what we say, you belong here. And we really wanna do life together as a family. And that's just a way for us to do that. If you are here today and you're beginning that relationship with Jesus and that's where you're at, man, fill that out, turn it in. We would love, it's not just a, a, for data or anything like that. It's so that we can do life together with you. And just know that God's going to receive glory from that. Amen. Hey, let me pray with you. And then we're going to come and respond. The worship team's going to lead us. And we're going to just ask God. I'm just going to, we're going to, pastoral staff prepare. We're going to lay hands on you and pray that God would just allow today to be a moment of filling with his spirit at a different level than ever before. There's a reason for that. God wants to do that in your life today. So Father, I pray right now that as we just come to this moment in this time together, that God, your Holy Spirit would fill this room. God, it's already here. God, you said in your word that where two or three are gathered, that you are here. We rest in that promise. God, I pray that you would just get us to the, the, the point in our own lives, Lord, where we would just have such a, a focused vision of you that any distraction would become small, that you are so much bigger, so much greater, that we would seek after you. And God, as we do that, your spirit would draw us and you would fill us like never before. Church, would you come and respond and let that physical step of moving out from the space that you're at to come forward? Let's just join together in prayer around these altars and asking God to fill this room. Join me at the altars today if that's your prayer.